So, by the way, uh, Ryan Neese, are you on the schedule, Ryan? So you guys want to talk to this young guy. He's in the process of the last two years raising a fund. You're going to hear from Greg, so I don't need to say anything about him, but track him down. His dad is Ronnie Lott, and the young guy's doing some amazing things, working with a lot of people in Silicon Valley, raising a fund, buying companies, investing in different companies from a venture capital perspective. So you make sure you chase him down. Uh, if Bill was here, he would tell me, don't talk about me, so I'm not going to uh, talk about him. He would tell me to share your story and talk to the young people to help them get to the next level where they want to go. Uh, I think that I can hopefully help you accomplish that today by sharing a few things. I grew up pretty un unremarkably. My mom had me at 15. My father was killed when I was three years old. I lived in the country in a trailer, 10 of us, and I slept with uh, two uncles for the first 12 years of my life in the same bed. Every morning we got up, slopping hogs, feeding cows, goats, chickens, did it again when I got home from school. And so we were really poor. I mean, li literally three, four days a week, I'd take mayonnaise sandwiches to school for lunch. I didn't know any different. I thought that was normal. Uh, but then I was able to go on to Stanford University, be a pretty decent football player, and then went into the real estate business, grew it to $163 million. I retired in 2008, and uh, recently, last year, two guys who are trustees at Stanford over time, they recruited me to work in their family office, Brad Freeman and, and Ron Spogley. Anybody in here knows them? Okay. Obviously, you do. So they're Stanford guys, alums. They, they, they own a large private equity uh, firm called Freeman Spogley. They've closed eight funds over a billion dollars. But I work for them in their family office. I do private equity for them in their family office, buying companies that have uh, you know two to five million with EBITDA. How did I get from where I was to where I am today? I want to share two or three different things I think you guys need to know, because I've sat exactly where you sit right now. I was at that point in your lives trying to figure out how my career is going to go, what are the things I really want to do, and how can I leave you with something that you can take away and not just give you motivation and not give you anecdotal stuff that you can't, you can go and you can be inspired, but what technically, what tactically can you walk away with? There are a couple things you're going to have to learn, and I know they gave me the topic of make a difference, I'm going to finish with that, but there are a couple things I think that's critical for you young guys to learn as you start thinking about how you're going to shape and mold your career in the future. One of those things is finding, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you got to find the sweet spot of what I call it. This is what I did. Before I started the company, I started, I'm figuring out who the, are the people I know, what are the things that I'm interested in, what are the resources I have. These are the same things. You're weighing yourself, weighing your network, trying to figure out how can you start a business, join a business, be a part of something. So I call this the sweet spot of entrepreneurship. For me, on this side, it's all about, it's all about you know, uh, me personally. So this is my education, uh, this would be my network, so people that I know, I may have you know, a little bit of money, whatever I might have. On this side, it's really trying to understand what are the things you have access to, right? So if you, if, if you have an education, you have a network, who are the people that you have access to in careers that you may have an interest in? So you start to look at career fields and you're looking for interest. And when you're looking for interest, it's not just can I go work for these people. It might be can they mentor me? It might be can I, can I shadow them for a day? Can I shadow you for a week? Can I learn more about the business so I can understand if this is something that I really want to go into? So understanding career interests and knowing people that are in the career uh, fields that you're in. If you want to do this, this is something that's critically important. You have to understand if you're going to start a business, number one thing to me up front, you got to understand how's that business, how do you underwrite that business, right? If I was a real estate developer and I want to go build shopping centers, most people want to say, let's go find the right land and then let's go find the tenant that'll go with it, maybe Walgreens or Walmart. But really, you really got to understand how's a bank going to underwrite this deal? Because that's where it all starts. You can't even do it if the bank won't underwrite a deal. Understanding whatever business you're going to go in, how what's going to make donors want to invest in YouTube? What's going to make donors want to invest in uh, a fund where you're invested in other venture capital type companies? How do you underwrite it? Because right? you want to know right up front, what is the value proposition of what I'm doing? And then to me, and I'll speed through this. The, the sweet spot here is figuring out what your skill sets are, what you what you have that's available to you, uh, what you have outside of yourself, trying to figure these things out, and then where they overlap to me is the sweet spot. So for me, I went to Stanford, I had a roommate, so he's in my network. Uh, I had an interest in going into real estate development. His father was a real estate developer, and so his dad gave us a million dollars in 2000 and one, and, uh, and then we grew it to $163 million. So that's just a quick example, but as you're thinking through the kind of things you want to do, I think that's the kind of process you have to start going through. If you start reaching for things that are outside your grasp, you have to start finding ways to pull it within your grasp. How do you get to know certain people in those industries? How do you get to know how you would underwrite things in different industries? Does that make sense? 
So I'm be a little bit boring at the beginning, but I think that as you leave here, I want you to be able to walk away with some things. The second thing I think you need to understand, when I look at a deal that I'm going to invest in, for you it might be a company or something you want to start, the first thing I start with is the people. So that's what POCD is an acronym. The people, no matter how good an idea is, people bring me ideas all the time, they want me to invest, and I look at, well, do you have any experience? Is anybody in, <laughs> in the company or the people you're talking about starting a company, do they have experience in this industry? Right, because you can have a great idea, you can have a great value proposition, but if you don't have the right people on board, you're never going to achieve it. So make sure you understand that. When you're trying to build a team and you want investors to invest in what you're doing, you gotta start thinking about, do I have the right people on board? What's my skill set? What's my experience? Who do I need to bridge into the team to build that level of credibility within the marketplace? The O is opportunity. What, 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 what is the opportunity? What are you really offering me, right? What, if, you're, if you want me to invest, what, what, what am I doing here? Am I buying something at X and then we're selling it at 2X? Am I you know, knocking down old homes and building up a new home? Well, what's the real opportunity? Define the opportunity. You have to have a clear thesis on what it is that you want to do. It has to be clear, it has to be attainable, you have to have numbers around it, you have to be able to put a budget, and you have to be able to communicate it very specifically. If you're in general, then you really haven't done the intellectual curiosity and the intellectual vigorous work that's required to succeed. You have to get down to the nominal details to really understand it and explain to someone the opportunity, and if I'm looking at it, I want to understand it. And then you have to understand what's the context. Right? If you're telling me that uh, we're going to go build residential homes in 2005. I'm in, right? Everybody's buying homes. They're getting zero uh, interest. They're getting no, no interest loans, nothing down, and uh, they're doing no dock loans. I mean, that's a great marketplace to build homes. Everyone's buying second and third homes. Uh, prices of homes are going up. People can afford them, but wages are not. Why? Because loans are cheaper. That's a good context. But what if you want to build homes in 2009, right? Now, the housing market has crashed. You have to understand the context of the marketplace for what it is that you're either asking someone to join or if you're looking to invest in someone. Really understand the context. For you guys, you're going to be look, trying to build a company or being a part of a company where you have to define the context uh, to other investors. And then the last piece is really just the deal. What's the deal? What is it? How much you want from me and what are you going to give me back at the end? If I give you a million today, your goal is to give me back what tomorrow, right? You have to be able to find that deal. So I'm just trying to give you some things to think about. These are the critical things if you're thinking about starting a company, if you're thinking about uh, asking people to invest in your company. You, if you don't understand these things, you're, you're not going to get very far. You can go online and, and, and research uh, business plans, but these are some of the core components of things that you have to understand and be able to articulate if you're going to be successful. And then as you start to think about what you're going to engage in, these are the kind of things that um, I would be sorting through in my own mind. Where are my proximity of opportunities? I think, Ryan, on your fund, uh, you started working with your dad, and then you bridged in some other guys. You, you build a board. Who, who are some of the guys on your board? You have Ron Conway, who, is, uh, who, who advises you often. Ron's a huge venture capitalist that, um, that's invested in a lot of the companies that you hear uh, by name here in, in Silicon Valley. But he started with building a board with people who had, uh, who had, who had names that had a, a success uh, in investing. And so that was a smart place for him, right? Because now he's starting to build that people piece. So when you go to regular people who may not have a name like a Ron Conway, then they're willing to invest because they understand who he has on the team. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, great. So the next thing we're talking about, and, I'll, and that's the last point I really want to close with, and Bill would talk about, is developing leadership. Now, leadership, to me, there's four different categories of leadership that you're going to have to be skilled at as you start to either A, want to get into business, uh, or anything you want to do in life, whether it's be a coach or anything you want to do. Um, leading down, that's the first part of leadership. I own a company, I'm running a company right now uh, for one of the companies that we acquired, and, I, and I'm actually the operator day to day for now. And I realized, okay, I've got all these, we own all these Dunkin' Donuts stores, and we've got all these managers, and I've got area managers, and I can tell people what to do, and they'll just do it. That's unilateral leadership. But what makes you more effective when you lead down is when you can create value for people that you are leading down to. So right now, we just created a new uh, bonus plan for our managers. 
And when I first came into the company, we saw that we could probably shave four or five points off the food costs because they were just had a tremendous amount of waste. They didn't really have any software to help them do a production list of what they were going to produce the next week. So we bought a software, basically $25 subscription per store, and it takes the average of the last four weeks of every donut that was produced by species and by quantity. And then it takes on Monday, the average of the last four Mondays, and it spits out a production list for this next week. So we know every night we bake donuts that every single donut that's, that's going to be baked is the average of what happened the last four Mondays in a row. Right? So now I've got a really accurate production list. That helped us get waste down. We were able to manage our waste a little bit or manage our inventory a little better. We, they were doing inventory counts once a month. We said, you know, we'll start doing inventory counts once a week. Why? Because inventory is when trucks are coming in, they come in every week and you're bringing new stuff in. You got stuff that's already there. You bring it to the front, the new stuff you put in the back of the freezer and you got to know what you have coming in and what you have that's still left there. And theoretically, it comes to the POS, you would think, but all the times it doesn't. Long story short, we hit a bump in the road. We couldn't get the last point off of our food costs. And so I'm like, how are we going to get this last point off? How are we going to get down from 30% from down to 29% of our food costs, 29% of our, of our gross revenues, kind of how we look at where food needs to be. And so I had to create value. I said, you know what, we're doing 15000 a week you know, in this one store. So one point is worth $150 a week to me, $600 a month. So I tell you what, I'll give you $250 if you get that point down. Because it's hard work getting that last point down. It's making sure nobody steals the soda's out of the freezer, that's in the back freezer. It's making sure that when donuts get thrown on the floor, or somebody drops it and everything's getting recorded. It's managing your inventory tighter. If the truck brings something in of what you ordered and you're, back, you're down a case of bacon and you gotta make sure you're accurately recording it. It just takes work from the manager to work the tools that we've given them to do it. So I created value for them and now we've been able to hit that final point. So leading down, really creating value for people, whatever entity you're in, whatever middle management or senior management that you're in, Learning to lead down is critical. Leading laterally, that's important, right? That's your peers. Those are people who you work with. That's building consensus. That's building coalitions. It's, it's primarily, in my experience, uh, has been the most important uh, variable here is facts. People want to know the facts. You know, don't, don't give me the, the rah-rah. Don't give me your strong emotional appeal. Just give me the facts, right? Your peers are motivated and moved by facts. Let's look at the data. So we're building a shopping center in, uh, in Walgreens, uh, building a Walgreens in, in uh, Daytona Beach. And we got different approaches that are coming here. We have a certain uh, retention on the site that we have to have. So a certain amount of water has to be held on the site. A certain amount of water has to go off the site. That's called on-site, off-site retention. And so the civil engineers built two vaults underground because we were in a flood zone. And we also had to plan for the 100-year the flood. And so as a result of that, we had a whole lot of capacity on our site that we need to hold water. And so they built two 500,000 vaults under the ground. That's how they designed it. So a million dollars in site work just for these two vaults. And so everyone's talking about how are we gonna, how are we gonna solve this? How can we change it? How can we reduce it? Uh, you know, what are we gonna do here? So then I visited the site, and then I noticed that next door there was a piece of property that was for sale, half acre, for $200,000. And I thought, you know what, let's go buy that site and then we'll, you know, we'll trench it and make sure it turn it into a big retention pond and then we no longer need those pond, those uh, re uh, retention basins underground. So the facts, right, then everyone, all my partners, all four partners are saying, okay, okay, that's what we're going to do, right? So they don't want me to come in and give a bunch of rah-rah. What can we do to change the numbers? What are the facts? So when you lead laterally, when you lead amongst your peers, uh, then you're going to have to lead by the facts. Leading up, that's next. That's people who don't need you. That's people who are going to be there long after you're gone. You know, the guys I work with now, they don't need me. We've got $750 million in their family office. Uh, I'm, I'm a guy that they decided to work with for certain reasons. But, but when you lead up, right, people that, 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 will, that can go on without you, you have to inspire them. They have to see something in you that perhaps you see further ahead, that you see clearer, that you see before others. That somehow you get involved in a situation and, and dysfunction becomes functional. That somehow you get into a room full of people with ideas and your ideas come to the top. You see people like that. Everybody knows people like that. You know, they're in your classroom. They answered all the questions when they're in school. They're the ones that's in the business meeting. Their ideas seem to be good. Everyone's kind of listening to them. That, you have to inspire people when you're leading up. That's such a critical, critical uh, component. When I went in to interview with Brad and Ron, they asked me to come in and interview. I didn't have any private equity background, right? I, I don't, I've never done private equity. And they were interviewing guys in their large company. They were interviewing guys uh, from family members and friends that they thought they wanted to be in place. 
And they brought me in as a guy who has a real estate development background, which has nothing to do with private equity. You know, and, and, and the jargon is completely different. The business language that we use is completely different. But what I told them is that, listen, you don't need more private equity experience. You guys know everything you need to know. You can read all the, all the uh, P&Ls. You can look at all the income statements and balance sheets. You can do that. What you need is somebody that's going to be able to go into this business and understand operations. And no one's going to show up before me. No one's going to leave after me. No, no, nobody's going to obsess over the details more than I'm going to obsess over the details. And let's start talking about how we built the company that we did build. And we went into some very specific case studies on value that I brought to the, to, to, to the, to the table. And ultimately, they decided to go with me because they, I inspired them. They thought that at the end of the day, they could trust you know, $200 million into my hands uh, versus other guys who had experience doing it. And so you have to learn to inspire them. And I would say use the facts and use the data to do so. And then the last piece of leadership, which is the hardest one, is leading yourself. If you can't lead yourself, you're never going to succeed. And there's a lot of work that goes on to leading yourself. I could probably do 10 different points on leading yourself. I'll give you one. People ask me, David, how do you, how'd you go from you know, incredible poverty to means? How'd you go from having a mom that was 15 to a father that was killed? I lost three of my friends to murder when I was 15. Uh, you know, I saw the two uncles I slept with, both went to prison, one for murder, one for armed robbery. How'd you get out of that environment? And how'd you get into a place like Stanford? And then how'd you want to run these businesses and be very successful? If I was to boil it down to one point, I would tell you that's about hard work. Now, that doesn't sound too sexy. But there's a whole lot of showing up early and a whole lot of staying late and a whole lot of sticking with something until you get it, until you can break through. And if you don't have that stick to itness, that, that dogged tenacity, that persistence, you're never going to be successful. I'll tell you when I learned. Greg, you'll appreciate this. I was a freshman here at Stanford back in 1994. And we had played in Arizona State. It was a night game. And uh, we played there. Arizona State flew back, and it was raining. And you know, like, guys, I got to go out to some of the party, so we're going to drive about a backside of campus by the driving rain into the frat houses. And at midnight, in the rain, there's one dude at the driving range with a light on. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning, we came back. Bye there, go back home where we're going. Three o'clock in the morning, in the rain, this dude is hitting golf balls at three o'clock in the morning, in the rain, by himself. And I saw him in the train room the next day. <laughs> you know, the train room, you got the tables. He's sitting right there. I'm getting my, uh, getting my wrist taped up. And I was like, Tiger, what were you doing hitting uh, golf balls <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning, in the rain? With a straight face. He was like, you know, it don't rain that much. So whenever it rains, I got to work my rain game. <laughs> he was dead. I was joking. He was dead serious. 18 years old, this kid had learned that, and he taught me something. He taught me something that was important for me to learn, and I want you guys to get it. And I want you to get on the visceral level. Not just the words I'm saying, but I want you to feel it. Anybody can show up early once. Anybody can stay late once. Anybody can make one A. Anybody can have one good game, one good season, but can you do it over and 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 over until there's no longer extra work? That's your normal level of productivity. In other words, can you learn to maintain high levels of intensity over an extended period of time across everything you do from academics to sports to business in relationships? If you don't learn that, you're never going to be as great as you can be. You will not maximize your full potential. If you can't lead yourself, if you can't work hard enough to when everybody else goes home, and it's not about I stayed and they left, it's I'm progressing the ideas, right? I'm putting in the real work and time because I'm intellectually curious. I'm trying to figure out how it all fits together. How can I take the next step? You got to learn that. Last thing I'll say about, about uh, leaving yourself. What can you come back from? Can I share your story? What can you come back from? Greg Camello, a friend of mine, went to Stanford with me, played football with me. He's here today in the back. He's going to be sitting on the entrepreneurial panel. You guys will be able to talk to him. Uh, Greg, we both played in the NFL. We used to spend every offseason training together. And um, he played longer than me. I was done after five years. He wanted to play nine or ten years, Greg. Seven years, <laughs> I've overstayed his career. But he didn't, you didn't go play in the Super Bowl against the Ravens. He was the starting fullback for the New York Times when they played Baltimore. That being said, Greg leaves Stanford, and he decides to apply to Harvard Business School. He gets into Harvard Business School. 
It goes through the first year. Was it all the way the first year or was it happening the second year? First year. They decided that academically they wanted to suspend grade. And they're like, okay, things are, you're not meeting the expectation here. And so they're like, all right, we're going to suspend you. Here are the specific problems. And they don't really give you a roadmap to get back. They just tell you kind of this is where you're left at. So Greg calls some people and people advise him, hey, don't worry about it. You know, uh, you know, you got a Stanford degree. You can go and do this other career. You can do different things. Just go get a job and do the things. He calls me up, and I was, and at first I was laughing. He called me because you know I saw him. I was like, what's up, man? What's up, dog? What's up, what? And he's like, hey, sober up. That's the specific thing. He said, sober up. So I knew something was wrong. He went on to tell me what was going on. I said, we only got one option. We don't quit. There's no quitting. They're just pushing through and finishing. Under no circumstances do we quit. You started it. You're gonna finish it. I flew out to meet with Greg just for this purpose. And we, how long did we spend together, Greg? A couple days? All we did, we went to a library, we got a room, and we just started putting ideas up on the board of how he was gonna get back into Harvard. Here are the classes he's gonna take at a local community college. Here are the things that he was gonna demonstrate. How was he gonna build the case? He talked to the professors, and he talked to Dean, the Dean, and found out some of the, the ideas on the plan we were putting together. Long story short, he worked the plan, he got back in, he graduated, and he finished with his MBA from Harvard. So y'all give him a round of applause for that. But he could have quit. And as a matter of fact, important people, important mentors in his life had told him not to go back and don't worry about it. What can you come back from? That's what matters a lot in this life. It's not just what you can achieve and what you can do. At some point, you're going to find yourself in the crux of, of a difficult place in your life. And it may not just be work. It might be personal. There's some relationship. You might lose someone. You're going to find yourself in tough places in this life. Tiger's in a tough place in his life right now. It's not about what you went through. Because once you get exposed, that's the healing piece, right? Once people find out about it, that's the healing piece, right? Now you have a chance to get out of it and to come back. It's about what is the story going to be after that? And so you guys, if you want to be successful, work hard. You have to be able to come back from whatever is required of you to come back from. You have to be able to understand the people, the opportunity, the context, and the deal. And even before you get to the right things, to start sorting through in your mind, where are the real opportunities? And where do my opportunities kind of you know, overlap with my resources. And that, to me, is a sweet spot for entrepreneurship. I hope that was helpful. I'll answer any questions if you guys have any. Otherwise, Mark, are we done? We're done. All right, well, thank, thank you. you.